Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today's webinar is going to be talking about symptom management for multiple sclerosis. Today's speaker is UCR Health Dr. Jay Rosenberg, and he's recently joined the UCR Health family to help support the growth of our multiple sclerosis clinic. Um, just a couple ground rules for chat. Um, any questions that come up, please feel free to enter them into the chat and we will get to them at the end. That way you don't have to worry about remembering your question. Um, and we'll be saving about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for you to ask any questions you may have. Um, lastly, this webinar is recorded. So if you'd like to reference it in the future, it will be on UCR Health's YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, I will also stop recording when the Q&A session comes up. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jay Rosenberg, and I'm going to take him off mute as well as turn on his camera, and I will let him take over from there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hi, I'm Jay. I'm Dr. Rosenberg. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I have a blog, and, and it's going to be published on UCR. Part of it is, but if you go to curescience.org, it's also published there. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, let's start, and uh, I want to just give you an introduction. My father was a psychoanalyst, and he talked at my college one very cold February night on depression. In an effort to explain his theory of the origin of human behavior, he used an analogy where he divided a microscopic organism into thirds. He stated two thirds of our behavior originated from environment and one third from genetics. During my career, I thought he was wrong. I thought I observed that it was two thirds genetics and one third environment. I have subsequently concluded it's probably closer to 50-50. Our brain is this amazing organ in our body and controls all. We are born with a limbic system of emotion that is genetically set. However, it's under huge environmental influence and control. There are millions of neurons and they, are project, they project their axons to make connections. These axons are covered in myelin that facilitate rapid transmission. The axons are organized into bundles which project connections throughout the brain driving our thoughts and behavior. Our emotional system therefore is complex, is a complex of multiple connections. I believe that much of our behavior stems and is driven from early childhood experiences. It is no wonder that with MS, the short circuiting of these connections by myelin breakdown can produce an array of symptoms. It can be very hard to understand. In an attempt to understand what is happening and what is the meaning of our symptoms, we use a variety of defense mechanisms. We move from denial to rationalization. We frequently jump to the worst of interpretations which produces fear and anxiety. I think all of this is normal in many and all of us. I hope this little talk will clarify and draw distinctions and definitions as to how to interpret our symptoms, reduce our potential anxiety and bring to bear some reasonable and acceptable explanations. So I entitled this talk, it is very hard many times for patients with MS to comprehend exactly what they are experiencing, understanding your symptoms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first of all start out a little about MS and um, set the tone uh, for the symptoms and maybe uh, give you just a little background into uh, MS. Uh, so wait a minute, start my video, okay. So this is a picture of the United States, and it shows the 37th parallel. And basically, uh, what it does is the, uh, the 37th parallel is the further away from the equator you are, the higher the prevalence of MS. So if you look, it comes around where Washington, D.C. is, and it's 110 to 140 cases per 100,000 in the north. 57 to 78 cases per 100,000 in the South. Now, the problem is that if you are born in the South and move to the North after the age of puberty, you carry with you, you the risk of the South. If you move to the South before the age of puberty, you then carry with you 
uh, and get uh, what uh, the northern uh, state risk is. Now, um, oops, just a second. Okay, here we go. So this just shows you uh, most of uh, multiple sclerosis had a high, has a high prevalence in the northern latitudes. And so you can look at Canada and you can look at Norway, Denmark, Sweden. They have a very high prevalence of MS. Uh, this uh, next slide really is the classical geographical distribution where the high prevalence is in the yellow and uh, the white says that it's no data available, but that's not necessarily true. There is data available and particularly in Canada. And I'd like to point out that down in New Zealand and uh, Southern Australia, they also have a very high prevalence and uh, that's because they're also further away from the equator, even though they're in the South. It says that 2.5 million people have MS. I think that's probably a low. 400,000 in the US, I think that's also low. I think it's probably closer to a million. And the economic, um, uh, economic burden is 23 billion per year, but I think it's probably higher. Now, it just, uh, who gets MS? It's age 20 to 50. Um, it's uh, more than twice as many women, probably three times as many women as men uh, develop MS. But you know, it's interesting at the turn of the century, it was men uh, at the turn of uh, 1890s, it was men over women. You might ask, well, what happened? Well, my theory is that one, women went into the workforce, so they were exposed more to the environment. And two, they probably started having babies lay later. And so uh, maybe pregnancy wasn't as uh, protective. Uh, it says it's more common in Caucasians, but I'll tell you, it's present throughout the entire world in all uh, ethnicities. Um, how's the diagnosis made? There's no single test. Um, it can be delayed. And in fact, uh, about 20% of patients who come to MS clinics don't have MS. It remains a clinical diagnosis and MRI has really revolutionized the diagnosis. Um, the diagnosis is determined by really fulfilling two things, dissemination in space, which means that evidence of damage is at least two areas of the nervous system. And dissemination in time is that the damage has occurred over a different period of time. So um, the uh, MRI has really revolutionized uh, the, uh, the um, diagnosis. And uh, in 2008, they started with um, uh, a consensus group, which by 2017 now has come up with uh, the following consensus for using MRI and how you make the diagnosis. So dissemination in space, meaning in, in location, it's either it's a clinical evidence of at least two lesions uh, with objective evidence of one lesion, and you could have a historical uh, um, evidence of a prior lesion, or at least one T2 lesion in two of the following four areas. Periventricular is the area around the fluid-filled sac within the brain. Those are usually perpendicularly oriented and they're, dos they're called Dawson finger fingers. Juxtacortical is right next to the cortex. Infratentorial is in the brain stem and below or the spinal cord. So you need two out of the four really gets dissemination in space. Now dissemination in time is you have at least two attacks separated by one month um, or the simultaneous presence of a gadolinium enhancing lesion, that is a lesion where the dye is taken up because there's a breakdown in the blood brain barrier and it indicates an acute lesion and a non-enhancing lesion at any time a new T2 or gadolinium enhancing lesion on follow-up MRI, irrespective of when that follow-up MRI is done, or the demonstration of oligoclonal bands, which are really in the spinal fluid. They're proteins in the spinal fluid that indicate um, immunoactivity. Now, they, uh, um, 
the term primary progressiveness, I just want to comment on. There was a uh, meeting where uh, uh, Dr. Lublin came and asked uh, the opinion leaders in San Diego, how do you define primary progressive MS? And everybody had a different definition. And so now the definition that came out of the 2017 McDonald criteria is you have one year of disease progression, that is worsening of neurological function without remission. Two of the following, either a type of lesion in the brain that is recognized by experts as being typical of MS, or two or more lesions of a similar type in the spinal cord, or evidence in the spinal fluid of oligoclonal bands or immunoactivity. Now, what Loveland did in 2013 is he introduced this concept of modifiers. Now, phenotypes, Charcot was the first person in 1867 to really do a disease definition of MS. And what he uh, presented really has stood the time. Um, the phenotype is really a description of subtypes of MS. And so what Lublin said is, look, you either have an active uh, lesion, an activity he defined as a new gadolinium enhancing lesion on uh, the MRI um, or a new T2 lesion or activity of clinical uh, relevance, a clinical relapse. So we'll talk about that in a second. Or it's non-active, which means that you don't have any of that. And that, uh, that regardless, it's stable. Now, they, he defined clinically isolated syndrome as really the first uh, recognized clinical presentation of the disease that showed a characteristic of inflammatory demyelination, uh, to but as yet, dissemination in time was not fulfilled. That is, can be non-active. The second it becomes active, then it really becomes relapsing and remitting MS, which then can be considered active or non-active. Active, again, gadolinium, T2 changes, or clinical activity. Um, the gets a little confusing when we talk about progressive disease. And when he talks about progressive disease, he really says, if you look at this, progressive disease from uh, accumulation of disability and worsening from the onset without an attack is called primary progressive. And progressive accumulation of disability after an initial relapse is called secondary progressive. But I wanna point out it's progressive disease. And he points out it can be active with progression. It can be active without progression. It can be not active, but still progress, or it can be not active and not progress, which is really, he defines a stable disease. The natural history, this is a very common uh, picture, which I'm sure um, uh, was shown the last time. And it just shows the yellow are uh, evidence of MRI activity, which can occur prior to the onset of the disease in a subclinical way and even talk about radiologically isolated syndrome. Then you have relapses which occur and you eventually come, you come back to baseline and then eventually you switch to progression. The green line just shows that over time we do lose brain substance. So the concept is what is lost is not regained. Uh, this is a disorder of inflammation and degeneration. Inflammation is the marker with immune activity and it's predominantly immunological. We originally thought that degeneration was not immunological, but we've changed and it's, we've now seen markers of our immune system abnormalities that really proceed and are associated with degeneration. So these are gonna provide potential targets and I think that there are gonna be a number of different targets in the future for um, progressive disease. And this is just the, uh, the expanded disability scale score, which is talked about. Basically, we have only three things that we can tell and, and judge as to whether or not you're the same, better or worse. One is accumulation of disability, which is what this scale goes from, 
neurological exam of zero to um, be, uh, to death, and then basically that uh, it's zero to six. Um, you need a gradual uh, assist in walking. That it takes seven point one years to reach six and primary progressive and secondary relapsing and remitting is twenty three point one years. But once you reach the level of disability where you're having difficulty walking, it takes about five years for both to reach the level of six. I often say six means you can walk a football field with a cane, 6.5, you can walk one down with a walker. Uh, so here again are the three things which we have to judge by. MRI activity is probably the most objective. We can look at the gadolinium enhancement. We can look at accumulation. We can look at atrophy. Disability accumulation as the EDSS score is, is difficult because our outcome measures for measuring disability are not great. They're, 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 they're not very defined and disability accumulation takes a long period of time. And then the final issue is relapses. Now, if this concept of relapses is extremely important. And I am struck by the fact that I gave numerous talks. I'd ask a person, what is a relapse? And I get very few answers. And so I want to emphasize that a relapse is a worsening of older symptoms, which is sometimes hard to distinguish but the appearance of new symptoms that last 24 hours and are objective and are not associated with any other problem going on in your body, any other systemic problem, no fever or anything. And they last, the relapse may last for a month. If it goes over a month, it is considered just by definition a second relapse. So on this one end, we've got relapse, which is, a, uh, is this objective worsening. On the other extreme, we have what we call pseudo relapse. And in fact, when patients call up, many times their relapse is really a pseudo relapse. A pseudo relapse is the appearance of these symptoms, but it's associated with fever, something systemically going wrong, some systemic illness. And the issue is that once you cure and um, you cure the fever, you get out of the heat, you get out of the issue that's causing this um, systemic response, then you return to normal. And that's a pseudo relapse. So you get pseudo on one end and an objective relapse on the other end. Now, the issue is in between, we have what I call, you're having a bad day. You're either having a good or bad day. We all have good or bad days. The issue is that when you have a good or bad day, it doesn't necessarily mean that your MS is active or not active. You're just having a good or bad day. And I think this concept is very important to understand because it's my observation that patients have a very difficult time understanding what is really happening to them. What is, are they truly having a relapse or not, et cetera. Now, here are the common signs and symptoms that we're going to go over. We got fatigue. You could look at them, spasticity, pain, tingling. We'll go through this list. Now, fatigue, it's very interesting. Fatigue turns out to be one of the most common symptoms of MS. And in fact, back about 20 years ago, when we were developing guidelines of uh, uh, objective um, evidence-based guidelines for MS, we looked at what symptoms should we go with first and fatigue was the number one issue. And so we went with fatigue. And so I say that in fatigue, it's this chronic persistent activity limiting sluggishness um, that is present more than 50% of the time and uh, it, is, uh, relative, it is very limiting. Now, as far as, um, as far as the causes of fatigue are concerned, I like to think about MS fatigue and non-MS fatigue. The non-MS fatigue 
are fatigue caused by various other problems. So here we have um, infection. Any medical illness can cause its and have its effect to cause fatigue. Weather, specifically heat. Man, when it heats up, we all, we all prune. And uh, I think that basically uh, it, it, it could be a major cause for fatigue. Obviously you wanna dress lightly, you wanna use air conditioning and air conditioning is really the key thing. Medications, which are sedating medications, um, some of the benzodiazepines, uh, Valium, uh, Xanax, um, Lorazepam, these are medications that can cause changes that really can lead to fatigue. Stress, by and large, can cause fatigue. And I can just tell you, having been under stress for the last month for many reasons, I will tell you that stress will lead you to feel really, really fatigued. I define stress as the following. We all want an emotional um, equilibrium. We wanna be in a state of whatever we wanna call Zen. Anything that's we, uh, that deviates from that causes an emotional response, some type of response. And it's that emotional response to any change that occurs that's determined and that's defined as stress. Depression is um, uh, the sad state, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And uh, that certainly can lead to fatigue. Now, once, uh, and sleep, man, sleep issues, if you're not sleeping well, and as we age, we don't sleep great, um, this can certainly lead to fatigue. In addition, if you're overdoing your physical activity and you get yourself wiped out, again, that leads to fatigue. Now, once we've ruled, um, this is just talking about the issues around sleep and the fact that uh, you really, sometimes a, a nap in the afternoon, a uh, power nap can really help planning ahead, pacing yourself, um, prioritizing how and what you do, do most of your things in the morning, um, actually trying to uh, do self-meditation and uh, help yourself with um, falling asleep that way and eliminating any type of uh, caffeine or stimulants really can help you improve your sleep. Now, once we have gotten and ruled that out, we're left with two different things. One, I call it secondary MS fatigue. That is the fatigue that comes from muscle weakness, where it requires a great deal of effort to do a normal activity. Muscle stiffness, such as spasticity, which again requires increased activity and as a result of nerve damage or difficulty in breathing and uh, shortness of breath or difficulty in, in really um, having endurance. And those really are what I call secondary causes of fatigue. Once you rule that out, I think you're left with what is called, what I call primary fatigue. And almost primary MS fatigue is like the long haulers of COVID. It really, I think, is a, it's an involvement of the hypothalamus and, and involvement of uh, demyelination. And it definitely occurs, is definitely problematic, and can be many times very, very difficult and challenging to treat. We've got medications. Again, we need strategies of... Um, stretching strategies that are related to um, activities and, and really pacing ourselves and, uh, and, and realizing that we have to, we can't do everything. We can't be perfect. We cannot be perfect or the person who we think we should be. I think that's a fantasy. Perfection is really a fantasy. Now, Understanding MS-related mood dysfunction is, uh, is really a challenge. And 
think about as I talk to you about the limbic system and all of these interconnections and the influence of early childhood issues, uh, this mood, these mood changes, anxiety, depression, um, they occur and they're, they're real. And um, they are many times, uh, depression is not necessarily a reactive phenomenon, but is actually a direct response uh, to demyelination. And again, I come back to the long haulers of, um, of COVID. Um, so now cognitive issues, which are um, the changes that seem to occur uh, objectively with our, our thinking process and our memory really, I think, falls into several categories. The number one thing is that with MS and with all of these um, short circuitings that occur, processing speed slows down. And there's just no doubt. If you just slow down and your processing speed slows down, and so uh, cognition slows down based upon that. In addition, you have difficulty with visual spatial relationships. Um, and I think you also have difficulty getting memory into the memory bank. Frequently, once it's in, uh, you can get it out, but not always, but it's getting it in. And then of course, depression really um, it, it is sort of overriding all of this and can override everything and be very hard to sort out really what's happening. I, I will tell you that there were many patients that I treated with fatigue and with multiple medications and different strategies that failed who were really depressed. So um, it's, it's something that I think is underrecognized and uh, our society uh, doesn't really uh, rec uh, give us, um, I don't think it, uh, it validates uh, mental illness and we don't treat mental illness very well. And we certainly don't treat depression well. And for depression, we can treat it with antidepressant medications, which are very effective and with talking type of therapy. Both of those issues are not well accepted uh, by the public at the moment. I'm hoping that things will improve. Uh, again, memory, um, as I said, it's, it, it's really a problem of trying to get it in and you use different strategies. I think this little thing called the cell phone is probably one of the major um, accomplishments. And I, honestly, I don't know how I could survive without looking at my calendar and uh, writing things down. And so I think this is an extremely helpful strategy for dealing with our memory problems. Now, abstract reasoning, which is really judgment, can also be affected by um, MS uh, cognitive issues. And uh, I, would, I would urge that major family uh, things such as paying bills and dealing with family problems should really be a uh, team effort between everybody and not just one person. If one person is in charge of uh, paying the bills and that person uh, slowly has the change related to the MS, you could, that person may not be aware and nobody may not be aware of the changes that occur and you can get into big trouble. Um, now, understanding spasticity. This is one of the most common symptoms of MS. It occurs uh, when there's demyelination uh, of the nerves. And again, it's uh, the, um, the conduction of electrical impulses slow down and it literally means stiffness. It's increased muscle stiffness, which means that more energy is exerted to perform your daily activities. Reducing spasticity can give you a greater degree of mobility and that can come through stretching or medication. Sometimes though, if you're extremely weak, uh, spasticity can be very, very functional. And uh, if you wipe it out completely, then you may be 
you have nothing there to really support yourself. So uh, a little bit of spasticity sometimes is very useful, but uh, generally speaking, severe spasticity um, uh, really causes more energy to be needed and, uh, and really um, reduces uh, function. So managing spasticity, there are a number of different strategies. There are um, mechanical aids, uh, there's uh, medication, uh, there's medication that's delivered via pumps directly into the spinal canal. Uh, there are mechanical aids such as, uh, uh, such as braces, et cetera. And sometimes surgical procedures are needed for release uh, in order to manage uh, severe spasticity. Now, this is really a very difficult area, MS-related pain. And I would say more than 50% consider pain to be their major problem of patients. Uh, and about 20% have it as a significant problem. Short circuiting in the tracks that carry the sensory impulses between the brain and spinal cord really cause this. There are various types of uh, pain that require different treatments and you really gotta talk to your doctor. Um, I think that the message that I'd like to get across is that narcotics are not an answer. Uh, heavy duty narcotics work very, very well in malignant pain but in chronic pain, they're really a two-edged sword. And uh, they may, in fact, in the short term, improve things, but in the long term have major side effects. Chronic pain can be burning and aching. Pain can be what we call the MS hug, where you get a stimulation of the, um, of the thoracic uh, uh, nerves that cause a tightening uh, feeling you can have uh, severe back pain. And a lot of the pain in the back is probably related to this uh, damage uh, and blockage by um, the, the myelination that causes uh, an imbalance. Our function is really related to the fact that when one group of muscles contract, another group of muscles have to relax. And when we have a breakdown in uh, the impulses, we can have two sets of muscles contracting at the same time. And that causes lots of difficulty. And um, it, uh, all I can say is that uh, there are people who specifically uh, work with patients uh, kinesiologists who work with patients to uh, try to treat this imbalance that at many times can cause lots and lots of uh, pain and discomfort. Um, pain can present as these burning dysesthesias that's, uh, or uh, Lermit sign is where you get this electrical shocks that come down your back. And then finally, trigeminal neuralgia, which is a severe stabbing facial pain, is relatively common in MS. And I have to tell you, it's a very challenging symptom to treat. When you see this in a young person, it's really a, it's usually a disease uh, of uh, older population because it's thought that um, it's due to the fact that one of the blood vessels gets very uh, friable, and, not friable, but stiff, and will press on the nerve, causing the pain. You reduce and relieve that, and you can get rid of trigeminal neuralgia in many cases. But in MS, it's really due to the fact that one of the plaques is located in the wrong place near the nucleus as the nerve ex uh, exits, and it really is a very challenging, difficult problem. Uh, medications that we use are Lyrica, uh, Pregabitrin, we use um, Tegretol, and uh, uh, we use Neurontin, uh, and they can be very effective. But there are also surgical strategies that also can be quite effective. 
uh, numbness and tingling this is a very common complaint. And if anybody's taken Diamox for high altitude to prevent high altitude illness or headache or for intracranial pressure, Diamox will create numbness and tingling. And I can tell you, it's a very irritating symptom. The thing to remember though, is it is not necessarily a serious symptom or indicative of something catastrophic but it's more of an irritating symptom and uh, something that we really have to learn uh, if we have it to live with and uh, try some different strategy, acupuncture or medications to try to reduce it. Now, visual disorders are um, a very common thing and they, they really come in two, two different varieties. One is they come in um, the fact that the eyes do not coordinate and you see double. And so you see two different images. And the way you know that is that if you see double, you're either gonna see them uh, one side by side or you're gonna have one above the other. But if you close one eye, the symptom, that double vision will go away. And that can be very helpful. Also, it would be helpful to realize and tell us as physicians whether the double vision is worse when you look to the right or you look to the left or you tilt your head, but that's double vision. The other optic problem, eye problem, is inflammation of the optic nerve. Now I'll tell you, there is a slide which I don't have here, but it came from one of the companies that I think should get the Academy Award for slide production. It shows optic neuritis in such a way because it shows various different aspects of it. First of all, it shows a very clear image where a guy is with a kite, it's colored, and there are trees. The next thing that happens is there's just slight distortion. That's the very first thing that you see. After the distortion, there's worsening distortion and then loss of color, loss of predominantly red, and then there's blurring. And this slide set really demonstrated that uh, incredibly. And usually optic neuritis uh, occurs, it's due to the fact that the optic nerve is involved from the demyelination because it's covered, uh, the optic nerve is covered in myelin and uh, it uh, can respond to steroids and usually is limited to anywhere from uh, six weeks to three to four months uh, uh, to improve. Most of the time we get back to baseline, although at other times we don't. And uh, it's basically uh, handled by <coughs> uh, steroids, drugs, and certainly uh, being aware that this is occurring. Now, vertigo which is the sensation that the room is spinning or we're unsteady. I divide vertigo into two different areas. If the room is spinning, then, and it is associated with a change in our position of our head, this is commonly due to the fact that the semicircular canals of our, of our hearing mechanism which ha they have fluid in it and that fluid rotates as we move and there are hair follicles that move back and forth and the hair follicles sense the movement of the fluid. And so that's how we tell what direction we're in. Now, what happens with positional vertigo is that the membrane, the basin membrane of this um, has calcium in it and that calcium will sometimes break off and get out of that semicircular canal and it causes havoc. And what happens is you have a positional change, you can count one, two, three, and then bang, the vertigo hits and you're, you feel like you're moving or the environment is moving. That's peripheral vertigo. The, the big problem is that our cerebellum, which is in the back of our brain, which connects to all over our brain, is responsible for our balance and that can be involved. And when that's involved, it's extremely challenging. Uh, at that point, we need canes and walkers. 
and they can help us with our loss of balance and keep us in an upright position. The problem is nobody wants to use a cane walker or have any type of a power chair because it wipes out the denial. And so, um, uh, and so um, it wipes out denial. And so I, I would say that falls are very frequently associated with cerebellar involvement and vertigo, this type of involvement. And falls are also associated with barriers. If there's a barrier in front of you, falls are very, very common. When I have fallen, it's been stupid things, and uh, I have done stupid things that I shouldn't have done, or there's a barrier that I've tripped over. So these are things that I, I think we need to be aware of. And uh, again, I think we have to be open to the use of certain equipment when, when we need it. And I can tell you, my former wife had MS, and I was, a, I was a guru of equipment. I loved equipment. I would get the equipment. She'd look at it and says, I'm never going to use that. On the sun, sun porch, it'd go. Now, it'd stay there until somebody wanted to use. Uh, and she said, well, I, I, I've got this great walker. So she takes the great walker to the person. And as she's taking the great walker to the person, she's using it. And she says, my God, this thing's the best thing next to it's It's incredible. And as a result, it's a gradual acceptance of equipment. And I think that's what needs to occur. And that's a, a real big challenge. Now, depression is, is something that is just present. It's related uh, to both a reaction to illness, but again, I think it's directly related to the involvement of the immune system and direct involvement of areas of the brain and this uh, disruption of uh, the impulses, as I've talked about before. And uh, it's, in, it's important to understand that there's a distinction between grief. Grief is loss. The blues, probably feeling blues as uh, maybe variation of days, time of the month or whatever, and true depression. Grief is something that um, is really associated with loss. And unfortunately, we all experience loss. We all are wounded. And the best grief movie I've ever seen was a movie called Bachelors. And it was absolutely incredible and uh, had the best description of grief and a distinction of grief from depression. Psychotherapy and medication are very helpful in the management of depression, grief, and the blues. And you have to talk to your physician. Now, the bladder uh, issues can really be defined as three things. One, problem in storage two, problem in emptying, or three, both. And uh, problem in storage is due to the fact that with disruption of the impulse uh, of the myelin, uh, the bladder becomes very, very uh, tight. It's like a, it becomes spastic. So any slight enlargement or, or any slight uh, filling of the bladder will cause an immediate contraction. And that's difficulty in storage. Difficulty in emptying is that the sphincter itself is tight and uh, you're trying to empty, but you've got, you have a very, very tight sphincter. And then at times you have both things happening. And the strategies are, uh, there are strategies for, for both. Uh, the symptoms are, as you see, frequency, urgency, um, uh, hesitancy, and incontinence. And this is this is really uh, a, a challenging problem. And frequently I refer to urology um, because I wanna make sure that particularly in women, we're dealing predominantly with a neurogenic bladder and not issues around pelvic stretching and pelvic floor problems related to pregnancy, prior pregnancy. Um, and so there are uh, multiple techniques, uh, self-catheterization, um, continuous catheterization, and all of these have their good and bad points, and you got to talk to your doctor about it. And I would urge that everybody should really see a urologist at least once uh, to make sure that uh, we have the proper diagnosis. Bowel issues, boy, difficult. Nobody talks about them. I was fortunate enough about, um, I would say, uh, uh, 
maybe 20 years ago to take part in a bowel uh, retreat where we talked about bowel problems for brain injured patients. Uh, basically, constipation is a huge issue. What we're trying to do is we want to produce submarines and not rabbit pellets. That's what they said at this, at this particular um, uh, seminar. And in order to produce submarines, we need fluids. Frequently, we don't take in enough fluids. Uh, why don't we take in enough fluids? Because if we take in too much fluid, then we got to go to the bathroom. So that's a, it's a vicious cycle between limiting our fluids and taking in enough fluids. And we need to take in fiber. And uh, fiber uh, is very helpful. I find Miralax is also extremely helpful. And uh, the, the, everybody really should talk to their doctor if you're having these problems. Again, we're not mind readers. I can't tell you, I'm not a mind reader. You gotta talk to us and tell us. Um, I'll ask you about your bowel and bladder, but you gotta tell us. And then we'll discuss a strategy and really come up with a bowel program. And uh, managing uh, bowel problems really is a high fiber. You wanna drink lots of fluids and you wanna to try to eat uh, the reasonable amount of, medic uh, of, uh, of food, of diet. But there's no doubt that I always thought constipation occurred only when you had severe spinal cord problems, but that's not true. It can occur at any time in MS and it can be very challenging to deal with, but it is dealable. Uh, sexual problems occur and they occur both in men and women. And uh, they have sort of different uh, problems, both uh, men and uh, frequently uh, women have uh, decreased sensation. And uh, as you look at this list and men uh, really have um, uh, problems with maintaining an erection uh, and delayed ejaculation. And uh, there are strategies and there are techniques for dealing both with men and women and the sexual issues. But I would say that the number one thing I would stress here is that communication with your partner is absolutely key. And if you communicate with your partner, you really can solve a tremendous amount of problems as long as you're doing it together. And uh, that can be uh, experimentation, et cetera. And uh, I've, I've been very struck by uh, the number of people and how all um, how uh, sensitive uh, partners are to each other as it pertains to this. So um, I would just end with the fact that we want a healthy lifestyle. Um, I think you want to have a regular talk time with your family. You want to really uh, have a positive attitude and I have to say, I, I, I had a, a, a license plate that said, be upbeat. And we went and looked and it was a 19, I got it in 2019, it was on a 1994 car. And uh, I just subsequently um, reactivated it. And so I think we wanna be upbeat, we wanna be communicating, we wanna realize that this is a family illness that we're dealing with and that it is treatable. And we as physicians are here as your partner uh, to really help you deal with it. And I'll end with that. Stacy, is there anything? No, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. So right now I'm going to stop recording um, and then